Good morning, everybody. Um, good to see so many of you with us. Um, probably like me, you uh, are laboring under the pressures of the uh, coronavirus uh, outbreak um, and thinking that surely a pandemic is, is more than enough for people to be dealing with and to be worried about. But in the midst of all of that, we have people getting super excited about the you know, bizarre ideas that this entire tragedy has been brought upon us by 5G. And you would wonder how that could happen. Um, it is partly because when people are scared, they look around for something to be a reason to be squared. And perhaps a relative of the common cold just doesn't cut it and they look for something more sinister. Um, there's also a serious problem that when people are scared, they trust the gossip of alleged friends far more than they trust proper experts. So one of the benefits you will acquire from this webinar is a friend who is the mega expert. Dr. Phil Chadwick did his PhD in the effects of EMF on the human body. He has worked in EMF and its effect on humans his entire career. He spent over a decade with what is an old money, the NRPB, now Public Health England. He's worked for the Department of Health. He's done huge amounts of consultancy work. He's been the past president of the Electromagnetic Society, I beg your pardon, uh, chair of the Senelec Committee, huge amounts of work on EMF. So Phil will take us through what 5G is and what it isn't and why we need it, uh, the health effects uh, and then the controversies. So we will, Phil will be taking questions at each section. Um, we have no doubt that the controversies will be the uh, throw up rather more questions. Um, and we think possibly the technology, given our audience, should have rather fewer questions. Um, so without further ado, Phil, tell us. Give it Thank you very much. Give an intro to what you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great intro. Thank you for that. Um, let me just... Um, saunter through uh, kind of what I'm going to, what I'm going to do is you know, the classic thing, tell you what I'm going to tell you and then tell you it. Um, it's quite useful because you'll see the way that I've structured this and you'll see where the opportunities are to ask you questions um, and, and kind of how the weighting of the different aspects of this is going to go uh, during the webinar. So first off, um, slight case of I think teaching your grandmother to suck eggs for some of you, maybe less so for others. I'm Phil. going to gallop through really what the technology is and isn't and, and I know that many of you know this but it's kind of important um, because we can we can talk about the frequency bands but but most importantly when you're dealing with the issue it's actually quite valuable to make comparisons with what people claim we don't know versus what we actually do know and, and in that respect putting across into the relationship to the existing phone systems and other systems that we have is quite a powerful comparative tool. So I'm gonna spend a little time on that. Um, I'm gonna talk briefly about the likely exposure levels again in comparison to what we know and what's going on in, in the world in general. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what's different and why we need it, although that's not strictly my, my thing and I suspect many of you have a stronger understanding of the need than perhaps I do. Um, and then I'm going to very briefly uh, touch on the basis of limits and kind of where they come from. Um, I'm going to give the opportunity for a, a, a handful of questions at this point, really just for clarification. But I suspect certainly for this audience, most of this is pretty non-controversial. So a couple of clarification questions, then we'll move on to the more kind of more interesting stuff. Uh, next section is going to be health effects. Um, one of the perennial things you get chucked at you is it's not tested. So we're going to answer the question, is it tested? Uh, we're going to bounce around the existing database of 25,000 studies. Um, talk about the independent expert reviews that are a really good resource for you uh, to be able to answer questions on the state of knowledge. Touch on whether actually it's plausible that anything's causing any problems. The evidence of risk, is there any? People claim other effects, well yeah they do, so let's talk about that. 
Um, sensitivity, some people say that's great, but I'm hypersensitive. Well, are you? Talk about that. And then could the science change? So, okay, we understand what the position is now, but hey, you know, they locked Galileo up for saying that uh, the Earth was, was not the centre of the universe. Couldn't we all be wrong? And we'll, we'll talk about that as well. Questions and answers. And I suspect a few more questions and answers uh, at this point. There's some quite interesting little things to tease out uh, of this lot. And then the final section is going to be the conspiracy theory stuff. Um, I've chosen some of my favourites, which I'll talk about. Um, you guys will have your own ones that you may want to talk about. And we're at this point, we can open it up and we can really go through almost anything you want. So the ones I'm going to, I've identified to kick off. Um, is 5G a weapon or, um, or military technology? Um, has the insurance company refused to cover people uh, against disease or injuries caused by phone technologies? Um, is 5G killing birds and bees? Uh, and the great one, does, oxygen, does 5G suck all the oxygen out of your body, which is my all time favorite. And I actually sat down a couple of weeks ago and wrote a very long answer about this. And then at the end, we'll just leave the rest of the time that's available um, for, for questions and answers. Right, let's kick off with uh, what it is and uh, what it isn't. Um, some pretty fundamental stuff. We know, of course, that 5G is uh, radio. It sits um, in the microwave part of the spectrum, around about the same area populated by mobile phones and all of that stuff. Um, one of the more useful comparisons I found um, is to look at each of the three main frequency allocations in the UK and say, well, OK, the activists are claiming this is new, it's untested. What actually do we already have that's in those bands that we can compare it to? Um, obviously, at the lower, in the lower band, which is about six or seven hundred megahertz, um, we already have and certainly used to have TV running at six or seven, 700 megahertz. And there's a direct comparison that you can make there. Um, not surprising since some of the old analog TV band was actually taken and used uh, for the lowest frequency spectrum allocation of 5G. And we can also compare that actually pretty reliably with the old 2G system, which was 800 to about uh, 1800 uh, megahertz. This band, 600 to 700 megahertz, as you'll appreciate, has uh, pretty good coverage. And I guess the intention is to use this with fairly sparse, quite high power base stations um, to cover mainly rural areas. Um, next band up is, is around about three and a half gigahertz. Um, this is pretty well analogous to uh, the 3G and 4G systems that we have at around a, a couple of gigs. So we can look at the vast amount of biology and research and all of that other stuff that was done for 3G about 20 years ago and say, well, hey, that was done at about two gigs. This is about three and a bit. Actually, it's pretty much the same stuff. So we can translate that across and say, if you're concerned about 5G, at these frequencies, a lot of those answers are going to be coming from the existing database on 3G, 4G. And of course, Wi-Fi at uh, 2.45 and uh, five gigahertz. And this, of course, is, is going to be the sort of standard mid-range stuff, probably a pretty much a replacement for 3 and 4G data and voice for mobile devices. I said IoT, maybe, maybe not. That's a bit of a controversial one. Uh, I've thrown it in really more to make it interesting. But certainly things like embedded um, uh, smart meters and the thing I have on my gas tank that phones home um, when it needs filling up um, currently runs on a 3G radio module that will eventually migrate across to uh, this mid band of 3.4 to 3.8 gigahertz, along with data and uh, voice. And actually most people objecting to 3G really don't understand that probably the bulk of the 3G currently and probably for the foreseeable future is going to be in this 3.4 to 3.8 gigahertz band that actually looks um, pretty much like the existing uh, 3G. And the reason for that, of course, is that it has good penetration. It gets into buildings. If I have a device in my hand, um, it can talk to it quite easily. 
In contrast to the top band of 24 to 28 gigahertz, um, people refer to this as millimeter wave, but of course it isn't. The wavelength here is actually about a centimeter. Um, wavelength at 300 gigahertz is about a millimeter. But this terminology of millimeter wave has, has kind of trickled down to cover this 24 to 28 gigahertz band. Um, this is an interesting one because as many of you will appreciate, this stuff doesn't penetrate very well. It doesn't really penetrate buildings. Most importantly, it doesn't penetrate the human body. So if I have a phone in my hand, then the presence of the hand around that device is going to pretty effectively stop it from communicating with an external 20 odd gigahertz um, base station. Similarly, if it's in my pocket or in my handbag, it's going to have a real struggle actually talking to um, an external uh, source of those sorts of frequencies. So my guess is this is probably not really going to be used for handheld devices as such because the practicalities of moving them around and the strange things we do with them, putting them face down on the table and stuff, is going to preclude that, I think, um, as, a, as a very likely scenario. It's more likely going to be used for fixed data links, maybe autonomous vehicles. I can imagine a scenario with motorways with antennas on gantries beaming down at vehicles so your automatic Uber can be driven by a 5G um, 20 or gigahertz signal, high data rates. And I've said probably there because I think this is an area where we don't really know where it's going to happen. You know, pretty clear what the other two bands are going to be used for. With this one, I think it's probably going to take off. There'll be increased bands probably at higher frequencies doing more esoteric stuff. And it's kind of one of those things that we don't really know quite where it's going. But again, we can make some useful comparisons. We've already got satellite broadband at up to about 20 gigs. And I used to have this at home. So there's already satellites with a footprint over pretty much the whole of Western Europe beaming down pretty much the same frequency onto all of us. So when people say it's a new exposure scenario, it really isn't. I mean, you'd have seen the new Starlink satellites going up, beaming stuff down. There's already stuff up there. There's the Astra satellite TV system 10 to 12 gigahertz, beaming it all down. And in fact, the signal strengths are not radically different, you know, in terms of general public exposure to um, the 5G top band, it's not a million miles out in most cases from what you're getting from a satellite. And again, the line of sight data links all the way up to 60 gigs, and they've been with us for many decades. So there's quite a useful comparison here when people say oh it's new it's untested well actually it's kind of not new the spectrum's kind of already full of all of this stuff um you guys probably already know this but one of the things you hear about is oh there's going to be an antenna on every lamppost because the stuff doesn't penetrate it's really bad of course it's kind of not quite like that one aspect of 3g much like um 4G is that it tends to use small cells and that's mainly because um, you can get better coverage of the population with small cells. If I've got one cell here with a certain number of channels and I've got maybe 10 people in a rural area that's fine. If I want to service 10,000 people in a city I've got to have an awful lot of channels, I've got to have an awful lot of power and I'm chucking power out in all directions so if my entire phone usership is sitting up here somewhere I'm still chucking quite a lot of power out into all these other directions so lots and lots of power not much of it going where you actually need it. With the small cells you've got rather than one big cell you've got lots and lots of small cells much much lower power covering a similar area so if all your users are up here you can um, have that small cell doing all the work and the other one's doing very little um, and you can use concomitantly much, much smaller power. So each of these small cells here can be you know, tens of milliwatts to watts, as opposed to tens to hundreds of watts for each of the channel sets on one of these things. And this is quite important because one of the arguments you hear from the anti-5G crowd is, oh, there are going to be lots and lots and lots of small transmitters everywhere on lamp posts. We're all going to be inundated with radiation. In fact, it's exactly the opposite because you get a lot more public exposure from having um, a smaller number of sparse high power transmitters than you do from having lots and lots and lots of very small ones. 
the analogy that I tend to use with this is if you think about altitude, you've got the altitude of one damn big hill, that's this thing, versus a landscape of maybe a thousand molehills. But the average altitude of a thousand molehills is very much less than the altitude of one of these big fellas. So it's, it's actually quite important to to not be afraid of the arguments about the fact there are lots and lots of small cells on lampposts and buildings and stuff. Actually, that's a reason why general public exposure will generally be lower uh, with 5G um, than with uh, 2 and 3G. Um, and that's a point where I think we could break and take any questions if there are any, because that's pretty much all I've got to say on the technology, um, on the assumption that as I say, I think many of you guys already know a considerable amount about this. Um, I think I was also going to cover actually why um, why we actually need 5G. And again, that's that's not really my my thing. But as somebody who lives in a rural area, my hope is that that maybe low frequency band um, six seven hundred megahertz will actually give us coverage in rural areas. And with the move to piggyback the police emergency services ambulance mobile communications on the existing phone service moving it away from tetra i think it's actually pretty important that we do have that rural mobile coverage and that's where i'll stop on that section alison if there's uh thank you very much phil um so we we have one question about health effects, so Phil may cover that in the next section, and if yeah. not, um, we'll uh, I'll bring the question back at that point. We have uh, one question about the wavelength of the six to 700 megahertz um, and 3G wavelengths. Um, so someone's asking a, the actual calculation at that point. Um, and another, qu the, another question was, um, how come 24 to 28 has lower penetration when gamma, gamma, gamma irradiation ah. doesn't penetrate? <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a really good question. Would you like me to say that one first? Or up to you, yeah. Alison, how do you want me to play it? Let me, let's do that one first, because that's a really good question. When I worked at NRPB, this was something that really discombobulated my colleagues in ionising radiation. They couldn't work out why for radio, as the frequency goes up, so the energy, the photon energy goes up, you actually get a lower penetration. Whereas for ionising radiation, as, right, as the energy goes up, you get a deeper penetration. And of course, the reason is it's a different absorption mechanism. For ionising radiation, it's a kinetic so you've got a particle whacking in and it hits you and the faster it hits you effectively I'm, I'm obviously making that a bit simple but the faster it hits you the deeper it's going to go in before before it dumps the energy into you um for radio it's an energy absorption mechanism so we are big bags of conductive water and the higher the frequency essentially the more lossy we are so we're actually better conductors and the energy is absorbed more effectively so if you look at 50 hertz magnetic field, it actually goes pretty much straight through you. Uh, if you come on to a few tens of megahertz, then the penetration depths get to be about the same size as the human body. and You get some quite interesting resonance effects. As you go up in frequency, as you get to microwave, then the penetration depth starts to come right down. So the reason your microwave oven operates at about 2.4 gigahertz is that's actually a pretty convenient frequency to give you a penetration depth of about that much in a piece of chicken. So it heats it really well. And then as the frequency goes up, that penetration depth comes right down. So by the time you get up to 20, 30 gigs, it's pretty much superficial. I mean, the standard setting people always say anything above about 10 gigs is, is just skin absorption. And that's possibly a little bit optimistic. I would say 15, 20 gigs. It's pretty much hitting the, the dermis and really going no further on that. If that answers the question, we always come back to that if there's more on that. I can talk about that all day. The other question, Alison, you had you had two others, I think. Uh, yeah, the other question was um, what what is the wavelength of the six to seven hundred meg are? 
The wavelength is 6700 mega. I, I'd have to work that out in my head. I know that 2.4 gig is, is 12 centimeter radiation. So we're coming down about a factor three on that. So that must be about, um, what's that, about 30, 30 40 centimeters at uh, 600 or 700 megahertz. I mean, it, it's just the speed of light divided by the frequency. Speed of light is three times 10 to the eight. Plug in your frequency, divide one by the other, and you get the wavelength. Pretty straightforward. Drop me an email if you want to know more on that. Thank you. Right, there are more that have been hidden. Um, is the power output for a 5G mast greater or less than the similarly sized 3 to 4G mast? Um, for size. <laughs> for what? Yeah. I, uh, pass. Okay. Should we? Shall we group these together uh, and um, look, um, maybe deal with them after the presentation? You can do these. Yeah, okay, let's, let, let's do that. I mean, I think, I think these are quite general questions rather than ones on, on the presentation. So yeah, let's press on and we can drop them in at the end and see, see where we go. Fantastic. Uh, let me just uh, scroll down to where I was on the presentation, pick up again. Uh, okay, let me share the screen again. Okay, so health effects. This is where it probably gets a bit more, um, more of my feel, maybe a bit less of yours, maybe. Um, first question, is it tested? You get this all the time. 5G is untested. It's really dangerous. Well, there's kind of two levels to this. The first question is the kind of technical one. Is it tested? Yes, obviously it is. Any radio system that goes on the market that's deployed has to meet... Um, the requirements of the radio equipment directive. It's got to be tested. It's got to show compliance with human exposure limits. And certainly in the UK, any base station installation is expected to have its ICNERP compliance certificate. So at the very most basic level, yes, it's got to be tested. Yes, we have to know that it meets the existing standards and human exposure limits. Although that's kind of not quite what they mean. So that, that's an answer to the question, but it's not necessarily a fair answer. Um, what they mean is, is the technology, is, is the radio system, the frequencies that we have, do we actually have data on human exposure from all of that? And this is what I was, this is what I was touching on earlier. This is where it's useful to make that comparison with the existing database. We've got a metric shed load of data, you know, even before the early 2000s, we had a good load of stuff on radio, but when 3G came out, some of you will remember, we had the Stuart Report, we had the Stuart Process, we had the Independent Expert Group on mobile phones, and we had a whole raft of national and international research programs all around the world. And in the UK, it was a mobile telecommunications health research um, program, which I was involved in at the start, run by the Department of Health. And we funded lots and lots of research into all of this stuff. It's probably the most researched physical agent after ionizing radiation. You know, it's, it's just not reasonable to say that we don't know that it's unresearched. 25,000 studies is an awful lot of studies. Um, and pretty much they, they give a picture of there really being very little to worry about. There are some that say there's a problem. Most of them don't. One of the issues is that you've really got to wade through it and you've got to say, well, okay, what's the balance of evidence? Which one of these is actually good? Which of them are really a bit rubbish? How do I weigh the fact that I've got one study that says some one thing and I've got 10 that says something different? Um, and in this respect, uh, it's really difficult to do this yourself. You know, you've got to be a complete polymath, understand epidemiology, dissymmetry, cell biology, all of that stuff. And I don't believe there's any human being on the planet who can do that. So when you see people like Barry Trower getting up and saying, oh, well, you know, I, I'm going to say it's really bad. Well, he's not an expert in cell biology or epidemiology or any of those other things. Whatever his expertise is, and I don't know, um, it's only going to be in one narrow area, as is mine, as is anywhere else, anybody else's. So it's actually really valuable to look at the independent um, expert reviews on this. And there's quite a number of them. Um, what I'm going to do now is to try to, uh, if I can, um, 
do a different screen share. So uh, bear with me on this while I make an attempt at that. Uh, if I stop that share and I share a different screen, yes, see that one? Yeah. Uh, what I want to do is to kill that one, swing into that one if I can. No, that's not the one. Expert review, sorry. I'm having the difficulty here that that's it. Yeah. This is a really useful page for those of you who haven't found it yet. Um, this is the International Commission on Electromagnetic Safety, ISIS. And they have a, a page where they actually collate all the expert reviews. Um, and it's kind of running collation. So actually, you see some quite recent stuff here, like the WHO statement on coronavirus, Mythbusters 2020, IGNOP 2020, R Panza, FDA. I used to say there's over 75, but it keeps increasing. It's, it's now 80, and that's gone up in the last couple of days. Um, so when we look at the body of evidence, it's actually really valuable to look at these 75, 80 expert reviews. So everybody on the planet, you know, the Australians and the Norwegians and the Swiss and everybody, have done these expert reviews. They're a really powerful resource because they are independent of industry. They're academic, multidisciplinary scientific groups. And it's really helpful to point at these as a good source for the evidence base as to why RF in general and the frequencies that 5G use are actually not untested. You know, these guys have looked at all of that evidence base and it's all there. Let's shoot back to uh, the other, uh, was it this one? Yeah. And then we come on to plausible mechanisms for harm. It, one of the most powerful arguments um, for 5G is that people believe it's 60 gigahertz, even though it probably isn't, most of it. And 60 gigahertz doesn't actually penetrate the body. So I have a real problem as to why I should be worried about 5G. Um, but more logically, that's using their own interpretation of it. More logically, uh, we've already said we can look at the evidence that exists at 600 or 700 megahertz. Um, we can look at the evidence base that exists at a, a couple of gigahertz. And we can say, well, actually, why are we worried about this? Um, and I, when you dive down into it, there are actually no plausible mechanisms for how radio can cause adverse health effects. We already touched in the questions on ionizing radiation, and we know, as I said, it's a kinetic effect. Um, ionizing radiation smacks into your body, it damages DNA, it can cause oxidation, it can cause free radicals, which can themselves damage DNA. There's an established biophysical mechanism, and we're actually pretty sure about how that works. Uh, for radio, that mechanism doesn't work. We are at photon energies that are many orders of magnitude too low to cause ionization. So it's not directly carcinogenic. And we then struggle to understand exactly what it is that radio can do that can actually damage people. And there are a number of claims floating around about how it might do it involving free radicals and stuff. But when you dive down into the biophysical mechanisms of any of that, it's really wildly implausible. And I can explore that in the questions if you want. But it's important just to say, actually, there's a distinction between UV and ionizing and radio, because we don't actually have any basis to believe that radio, apart from the thermal effect, and if you have enough of it, it's going to heat you up. If you can avoid that circumstance, then there's really no mechanism that we know of that can actually cause damage. And that's quite an important argument, because for a plausible adverse health effect, you need to have some evidence and actually a reason why you would expect that it would exist. And we're really lacking that at the moment. And also, you know, we've had mobile phones for 35 years. I'm not an earlier adopter and I've had one, you know, 25, 30 years. We're absolutely not seeing people dying in the streets from this. It's, it's, this is quite important. You know, if there was an issue with mobile phones, we would have seen at the general public population level, we'd have seen an increase in maybe various cancers, maybe brain cancers, concomitant with 
the time scale of the introduction of phones, a bit of a time lag for whatever it is you're looking at to be to happen. And then you'd expect to see some sort of spike in brain cancer. Or you just don't see that. If you dive into the cancer registries and the public health registries, you actually, you can see stuff associated with changes in drinking alcohol and changes with smoking in obesity. All of that stuff exists in the public health records, but you cannot identify any evidence of risk with a temporal association with the introduction of phones. And again, that's, this is quite important because it's telling you that if there is a risk from phones, then actually it's pretty small. You know, we really aren't seeing people coming down with major illnesses from this. So if there's a risk, for whatever reason, it's going to be something that we can probably say is pretty much indistinguishable from zero, even if we believe it exists. And yet, people do claim other effects at lower levels. And you will go onto the internet and you'll look at the activist websites and you'll see study after study after study cited claiming an effect on rats, claiming an effect on brain cancer. And yeah, these studies exist. And there's actually a really important reason for that. And this is probably one of the most important take home messages of the day. We talked about this existing database of 25,000 studies, right? They don't all say that there's no problem. Uh, and one of the reasons for that is that in biomedical research, there's actually a pretty finite um, false positive rate. You know, you actually find that about 25 to 30% of studies are basically wrong. They, they're either statistical flukes or they're really badly done or they can't be reproduced. And at the moment in biomedical research, there's a thing called the reproducibility crisis where they're actually finding that great rafts of stuff that they thought was true, when you try to reproduce it in an independent lab, nobody can reproduce it. So the current estimates, and there's a really good paper, if anyone's interested, by Ken Foster on this, is that about 25 to 30% of everything that's out there is basically wrong. So given that you've got this database of about 25,000 studies, it's no great surprise that you can identify a couple of thousand studies that actually say, yeah, there's a health effect, because that's exactly what you would expect to see on the basis that probably about 25% of them are actually wrong. In fact, it's actually slightly fewer, and that's probably because the quality of EMF studies tends to be slightly better overall than the whole of the rest of biomed research. So yeah, you can very carefully construct a case for harm at lower levels by only cherry picking from the 25-30% of studies that actually show something. And that's why it's important to look at all of them and to look at these independent expert reviews who've actually reviewed all of the studies, and not just the ones they like, and have said, you know what, there's this evidence and there's that evidence, but overall the picture appears to be this. And that's a really important message. So if you try and engage with an anti 5G activists, they will just throw study after study after study after study, single studies at you, and it's impossible to refute them all. But what you can say is, well, that's great, but the big picture here actually is uh, that there's a lot of studies out there, and if we look at all of them, there's a, an error rate, and looking at the totality of the evidence reviewed by the independent expert reviews, uh, we actually find that the picture isn't, that there's apparently a major problem here. Uh, and we come on quickly to, uh, are more people sensitive to EMF? Um, I don't want to spend too much time on this. Uh, there's been a lot of research on this, and the answer pretty much is no. So a lot of people believe they're more sensitive to EMF. But actually, when you do the proper clinical double-blind trials and you expose people in facilities where neither they nor the researcher know they're being exposed, uh, actually, they can't tell the difference between a real exposure and a sham. So WHO have got a very good fact sheet on this. The answer actually appears to be no. Given that there's no plausible biophysical mechanism that we know of for harm, you also wouldn't expect a spectrum of response uh, from that. So you'd be looking at a different interaction mechanism completely that's specific to these people. And that's actually quite hard to conceptualize that some people have a, a receptor mechanism that the rest of us don't, just don't have. And that's important. And then pretty much finally, people say, well, couldn't the science change? You know, they laughed at Galileo, all of that stuff. 
Yeah, but as I've already said, we've got 25,000 studies on this. You know, there's four or five decades of research. It's an absolutely colossal database behind the conclusions that we have. Bearing in mind that we can map across from the existing 3G, 4G stuff onto 5G pretty much. Um, to change that scientific perspective, you would need to have as many studies again as we've already got, but all pointing in the other direction. That's not really very likely. I mean, there isn't a whole massive amount of research going on right now because we have already a colossal database and pretty much nobody in the scientific community can find many questions that we haven't already answered. There's a few bits of interesting stuff around the corners, but whereas 20 years ago, there was just loads and loads and loads of research these days, there's almost nothing going on and almost nobody's really funding it because it's just not that interesting. But there are very few unanswered questions and the funding bodies are putting their money into public health issues where they actually think that money can be more effectively spent. And I hate to say it because it's kind of my career, uh, there isn't a whole lot of money going into this these days. So I don't expect there to be a whole raft of new studies. So I don't expect there to be anything ever like a number approaching the 25,000 that we've already got. So no, pretty unlikely that the science on this is actually going to change. And uh, if we can take some questions and answers um, on this part now, Alison, that would be great. Okay, um, we are we're 40 minutes in at the moment, so we have some, quick, yeah. we have some very technical questions, which I think are better covered separately. We have some other questions that we have to say we refer you back to the fact that there are always going to be campaigners that, um, depart, that, 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 uh, that are outliers that, uh, that show health effects. But there are a lot, there are a percentage of papers which frankly are not sufficiently well built. Um, and you have to look at the consensus of well-designed papers. Uh, there have been questions about research um, it's, uh, along the lines of research and smoking was funded by the community. I have some trouble hearing you actually, Alison, sorry. I was having a bit of trouble hearing what you said. Uh, uh, in that case, shall I come to the next section? The next section. Yeah, maybe we do them at the end. Let's, 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 let's truck on. The last section is going to be quite quick because I'm not going to spend a massive amount of time debunking conspiracy theories because you could spend your entire life doing that. So I will move on to the next section and then we'll just take a whole raft of questions at the end, depending on how much time we've got, I think. And you can prioritise them as well. That's great. Okay, onwards. Uh, share the screen again. Uh, so, on the conspiracy theory, theory stuff, um, these are the five I'm going to address. And in fact, I don't have any slides on this. I'm just going to talk at them. And I think that's probably the best way of doing it. Um, so I'm actually having just shown you what I'm going to cover. I'm actually going to stop sharing the screen now and just talk. So I think that's probably easier. Um, first one that you always get thrown at you, is 5G a weapon or military technology? You're going to guess that my answer to all of these is going to be no, so that's not a great surprise. Um, this comes from the idea that there is a US military area denial system that uses millimeter waves, but it uses very, very, very high power beamed at people from a massive antenna array on the back of a truck. And it's a crowd dispersal system. It makes people uncomfortably hot by essentially being millimeter waves straight at them, but it's like megawatt EIRPs, it's just colossal. So no comparison with 5G. The only coincidence is they both use millimeter waves. And the argument I tend to use here is that, well, okay, the military use millimeter waves, but the, mili the military also use water cannon, and that doesn't make a, a bottle of Perrier uh, a, you know, a military weapon. So that's kind of pretty much where all that comes from. There's nothing else to it. 5G wasn't developed by the military, developed by the 3GPP consortium. It's not a military system, it's just a radio. The next one is a great one. Has the insurance company refused to cover anyone against disease or injury caused by phone technologies? Well, 
this often gets thrown at you. And if you, if you actually try and dive down into it, the answer is pretty much no. I mean, they actually don't routinely cover you for suing a mobile phone operator because you think you've got brain cancer from a mobile phone. And the reason for that is the same reason my house insurance doesn't cover me from being kidnapped by space aliens. You know, it's just not a plausible outcome. And the, the insurance company, and they're pretty clear on this, actually just don't want to fund people speculatively suing mobile phone companies. There have been a number of court cases where people have sued mobile phone companies and none of them so far have succeeded. They've either all failed or they've been parked. Here it talks about class actions, well, great, but there hasn't been one that's actually gone anywhere yet. So the insurance companies have just said, until the science changes, we're not going to fund any of this stuff. So yeah, you won't get insurance to sue your mobile phone company, but that's not because the insurance companies are scared. But I'm really just running through this stuff. I mean, these, these are the things that I've identified. And is 5G killing birds and bees? Well, no, it's not. And uh, let's have a quick look at, stop share, uh, share a screen. And let's go to that one and go to Snopes is always your friend here. There's a great debunk of this on Snopes. Go and have a look at it. Did a 5G cellular network test cause hundreds of birds to die? The answer is no, because one, it wasn't 5G. And two, it wasn't turned on. And three, the birds died of some other cause. It's quite interesting. You often get these events where loads and loads of birds seem to die and seem to fly into the road. There was one in North Wales recently where the road was iced. The birds made a mistake. A load of starlings crashed into the road and killed themselves. And this doesn't happen infrequently. So you do find dead birds lying around, nothing to do with 5G. Um, on, on the bees thing, we organized a session at the BioEM conference in Cape Town in 2014 on the effects of EMF on animals. Great paper on a guy who'd done lots of stuff on bees wagging their wings you know, in response to different frequencies, nothing there. Really, this is just one of those things you hear. Bees are having a hard time with the um, viruses and the parasites hitting the hives and the pesticides and stuff. So bees are dying and we have 5G, but it's not cause and effect. You've got two things happening, but they're not related. Um, and it's just one of those silly things. You know, there's no reason why bees would be any more sensitive than any of the rest of us uh, to 5G. And again, there's a reasonably substantial science database on this. And then finally, my absolute favorite, does 5G suck all the oxygen out of your body? I mean, when I saw this, and I, I, it's just so ridiculous. How do you even address that as a, as a constraint? It's like trying to explain why the sky isn't made of blancmange, right? It's just really, really difficult to get your head around why anybody would even say that. Um, so I actually wrote, um, on my 5G facts that I have, and we'll just scuttle across to that. Uh, here. Uh, I've got a series of facts. So, you know, all of everything I've said, you will find in these 5G facts. Um, and you can have a look at that. I will bring the reference over to you at the end. Um, Ianfields.com, go to the facts. And at the end of the facts, this is something I just wrote because I got sick of trying to explain to people using the same text over and over again, typing it all in, what the issues were. So I basically typed them all out as a one-off in the facts. And the other weekend I sat down and I actually wrote an answer, believe it or not, to why 5G doesn't suck all the oxygen out of your body. And you can scuttle down and you can read it all and it's got some nice graphics and it's all there. Um, essentially the take home message is the argument that they use is that 5G uses 60 gigahertz. 60 gigahertz is an oxygen resonance in the air. Therefore, somehow this translates to oxygen in hemoglobin being sucked out of your body by 60 gigahertz 5G. So the very short response without going into all the scientific background on all of this is first of all, at the moment at least, 5G doesn't use 60 gigahertz. 
even if it did, we've already said 60 gigahertz doesn't penetrate the skin. So if you're worried about oxygenated hemoglobin in the blood vessels around your lungs, 5G is not going to get there. And oxygen bound to hemoglobin doesn't anyway have a 60 gigahertz uh, resonance. It's a, it's a free space thing where it's an absorption mechanism where oxygen in the air is quite good at blocking radio waves at about 60 gigahertz. Doesn't happen in oxygenated hemoglobin, completely different. And the final point is that having a resonance doesn't mean that the oxygen is pulled out of your body. Hemoglobin, oxygenated hemoglobin has a resonance. It does have a, a resonance. It's at 660 nanometers. It's in the red light region. And that's why oxygenated hemoglobin is red. So there is a resonance. And that resonance is why hemoglobin is red. And it doesn't mean that shining a red light on people pulls the oxygen out of your hemoglobin. And for exactly the same reason, and for some other reasons as well, 60 gigahertz exposure will not pull the oxygen out of your lungs. And if you want to know more about that or about any of the other things, go and have a look at the facts. Everything that I've said today is up in the facts. Um, there's some interesting ones like can sweat glands act as antennas for 5G? Um, there's a military technology one. There's a whole raft of uh, fairly straightforward facts ranging from some quite complicated stuff on the precautionary principle through to some of the more nutty um, conspiracy theory issues. Um, and at that point, with about only about 10 minutes to go, I'm afraid, I'll stop and we'll try and take some questions in the time we have left. Um, so uh, we, a couple of questions, some technical stuff. If you have uh, three, and um, if you have uh, telephone, uh, telecoms masts uh, near each other, a five, three and 5G masts close by, um, or, and different ante or presumably they also mean different antennas on the same mast, is it like noise that different sources uh, start to add everything up? I'll mute and Phil can answer. Yes, it absolutely is. Um, when you install a, a, a mast, you have to be able to show that the mast itself in isolation meets all the exposure limits. But you also, under the Radio Equipment Directive, there's a Sunlex standard, which my group wrote, which actually requires that there's a putting into service component. So at the point at which you throw the switch, the contribution that that mast makes to the radio environment, the exposures of any of the members of the public, also doesn't exceed the limits. So the total environment has to be looked at because yes, when you have multiple, multiple sources at different frequencies, they do all combine and there are complicated formulas for how you combine multiple frequencies. And this is something that's actually quite important for people who go onto rooftops and actually the occupational exposures close to antennas because there you do have to worry a little bit about exactly what frequency range it is. But there are some quite sophisticated measurement instruments now that do all that summing for you. So the guys who actually go up there and do the practical measurements and do the climbing generally have the kit that does that summation. Okay. Uh, the, we, we had a question about who it is that funds the research. There, is, there was various research done in smoking that was financed by the smoking, by, by tobacco companies. Um, sorry, Philip. I'll answer, I'll answer that. Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, in the very early days, the mobile phone companies funded it themselves. And I can remember Motorola getting up at the end of a meeting going, hey, we've got research money. Who's interested? It's a really bad idea because, you know, as you said, it's just tainted. It's like the tobacco companies funding the research. So those studies I talked about, the big national and international research programs that were set up, they're all funded um, via um, either government bodies like the Department of Health or research trusts. So the industry don't fund the research themselves because it would be completely pointless. Um, there's a bit of a confusion because in some cases, for example, the mobile phone research program in the UK was funded by the Department of Health, but the, 
the government actually extracted some money as a levy on the mobile phone industry to help pay for some of that. So there's an argument that some of their money was used to pay for it, but they weren't involved. They, they, they didn't fund it, basically. They were essentially taxed. And some government money went in, some money from essentially the 5G spec, the 3G spectrum option, and then some other money from the operators went in to that pot. But it was run absolutely hands off and firewall completely from industry. And, and that's actually a really important point because it's completely pointless having the mobile phone companies doing fundamental health research because just nobody believes them. Thank you. Um, some questions about uh, is 5G uh, continuous wave or pulsed? Um, and how do you measure, how do you accurately measure um, pulsed versus continuous um, exposure? Um, it's effectively, it's, it's, it's continuous wave. I mean, there's an awful lot of confusion about this. I mean, people believe that, I mean, let's rewind. 2G was, was pulsed, not because of the digital ones and zeros belting out the, you know, the actual data. It's just because it used to transmit into discrete time slots where the base station would talk to phones in different time slots. So the base station would talk to each phone. If there were phones at different power levels or there was a slot missing, you get a pulsing effect. 3G, 5G and all this other stuff doesn't work that way. It's, it's more of a code division, multiplic code division multiplex thing. So you don't get this discrete pulsing that you got with 2G. And I can remember in a court case, I was an expert witness about 15 years ago, being cross-examined by a QC for about an hour and a half on exactly why 3G doesn't pulse. So no, 5G doesn't pulse in, in the sense that it's a bang, 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 bang. There are some modulation changes. It's a really complicated system, but it's not pulsed. But it's really not easy to measure. There's a lot of spread spectrum stuff going on multiple uses of frequency it's a really difficult thing to measure and um, there are groups who are working on and have worked on very specific measurement protocols for how you can actually measure 5g accurately and they generally require a pretty dedicated kit so when you see a youtube video of somebody waving some yellow box around in front of a, a, a mast and going oh that's really big that's complete junk you know you cannot buy a, a box from a company on the internet for 200 quid that's going to tell you what a 5G signal is. You need some sophisticated kit and you need to make the measurement properly and well. Lovely. Um, quite a lot of, there's a lot of, a lot of interest of it. I mean, a lot of the, uh, the whole um, COVID caused by 5G is around the exposure of the public. But clearly there are actually people who have far higher exposures than the public or you would think would have far higher exposures. And those are the telecoms workers actually working in proximity to, to functioning antenna. Um, can you tell, what can you tell us about their exposures? Yeah, that, that's interesting. I mean, my, my background, I mean, the reason I moved away from public health, working departments of health and went off into consultancies because my primary interest is actually occupational. That's what I actually enjoy doing because there are real measurement problems there. It's actually, you know, measuring public exposures from base stations is politically interesting, but it's not an interesting measurement. It's not an interesting way to spend your whole life. So I prefer to go out into industry and do actual measurements in power stations, steelworks, broadcast. There are places where you can approach and exceed limits. Um, generally, the industry controls this very well. You know, they have good processes in place. The challenge sometimes can be transferring those processes to third parties who are going onto their sites. Often they have personal dose meters, but generally that's a well exposed, a well exposed, a well controlled situation, particularly the mobile comms industry and the broadcast industry are actually pretty much on top of this. They're one of the most sorted out industries in this respect of all of them. Um, there are places where you, you wouldn't go. I mean, you wouldn't dangle yourself in front of a high power TV, UHF, you know, megawatt um, mast. That'd be really stupid. But that has happened. I mean, back in the bad old days in the 80s, somebody got winched up into an active UHF array, putting out a megawatt of the IRP and they got pretty severely cooked. Yeah. So it's happened in the past. These days, they're very, very, very much more careful and the systems are in place. Um, you don't go and stand in front of an active antenna. And you know, if you're up on a roof space, the roof should be demarked, demarked out. 
and he wouldn't be doing any of that stuff. But yeah, there are places you know, up, up on towers where you need to be a little bit more cautious. That is absolutely the case. But there should be uh, permits to work, there should be systems in place for all of that. Thank you, lovely. Um, just by the way, when, when Phil says they were cooked, they, <laughs> they did actually live. <laughs> it was, um, it, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a single accident that, that a lot of people in the uh, safety people in the sector know about. Um, the, uh, uh, we, we use some extreme language um, and it's actually notorious for its, for its rarity. Um, those of us who've had people, workers walking around wearing non-ionizing radiation detectors um, will, will scratch to find, you know, really search to find times when these things have activated and they activate well below the exposure limits. Um, we, we have maybe to, to round off with a question of um, uh, why, why was the public not educated about 5G before 5G was rolled out? Um, and uh, especially because we've got so much distrust going on with COVID. I suppose the answer is technically it's not any different. But let's see what... Yeah, I, th I think that's true, but, but I think I, I would have to put my hand on my heart and say that I do think that some aspects of government took their eye off the ball a little bit with this. You know, with the 3G, we had exactly the same issues with 3G. If you can remember back to... 20, 25 years ago, you had people chaining themselves to masks. You did have masks being pulled down with bulldozers and being burnt down back in the late 90s. And the government actually put together the, the Stuart process, they put together a research program, they put together the independent expert group on mobile phones, and they were actually quite proactive on that. And I think part of the problem is they, that there was a feeling that they'd actually probably solved the problem and moved away. And there's been, a, as you say, Alison, there's been a lot of research on this. We have a much better understanding now than we did 25 years ago of the science. People tended to not worry about it. And the, the problem's been bubbling away. I've been seeing it for probably five years brewing. And I've been wishing that there'd been a more proactive interaction by the HSE, maybe by the Department of Health, Public Health England, actually going out there and pushing information out proactively. And that didn't happen, and it left an information vacuum. And now you'll find statements from PHE, from, from WHO, from everybody saying, yeah, 5G is not a problem. But it's, pro it's, it's, it's reactive and not proactive. And I think there was, I think it's a good question, I think there was an information gap that was allowed to develop um, because we became complacent, that's my answer. Uh. I think we, that takes us actually to 11 o'clock. We haven't been able to answer all our, everybody's questions. So you have, um, it's lovely, it was wonderful to see how engaged everybody has been. So we, we will um, share the questions with Phil and uh, get a, a, a Q&A together for you. Um, and uh, I think watch this space. There's, we, if you're part, if you're members of IOSH, uh, keep an eye on the broadcast and telecoms group pages. Join the group if you're not already with us. Uh, catch up with us on LinkedIn um, and join us on our next webinar uh, and um, see what more we can share.